And over in the second, we're not going to have, we're going to take that day, that Wednesday night off, and rest. It'll be right after conference, and believe me, we'll all need a rest. But we're going to, and uh, we're, we're just going to do some good things. We're going to have a good time in the Lord. We're going to bless those that come, and they're going to bless us. They always do. They always do. We just, I, oh, I'm excited. All right. If, um, you're, if you're praying for your conference pledge, the Lord will supply. I'm telling you. We have five already. There's five have already come in, praise God, out of the 20, 25. So we've got five. And again, I prayed about that. I said, Lord, now, you know, I'm trusting you that we, this pledge is coming. Had my insurance review. It's that time of year in October at school. I found out I had some stuff I had, didn't realize I had. And, he, and when I told him I had been in the hospital, he said, oh, well, they owe you some money. There's my conference money, praise God. Not only that, I'll pay the rest of my doctor bills off with it. Hallelujah. God is good, y'all. If you will trust him, I'm telling you, you'll get some things, you'll see some things happen. All right. Stand with me. Do remember that we have to bring your shoebox stuff. Y'all, we have little trinkets and stuff at home. We don't think anything, we don't think it's anything, but those children that have nothing will enjoy it. Bring it and put it. Go through your junk drawer and the old keychains that you collected from somewhere, you know, that you've never used, but they've been thrown in a drawer, little flashlights, anything like that that you can bring in and put in, um, in the shoebox for collection. All right? And help our kids. They're getting 30 shoeboxes. Praise God. And if you've got an old shoebox, just an empty shoebox, bring it too. They can use that. They're collecting those. Miss Tammy Feaster and her family... Our focus family, praise God, and uh, it's just going to be easy to remember to do that this week, isn't it? Miss Tammy's a blessing, and it was just a, a blessing to be able to, to bless that family today. All right? Now let's declare who we are. We're a family church, a Bible training center. We're changing Lancaster, South Carolina, and we're excited about Jesus. Yes, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our vision is Jesus Christ. Our mission is to preach, teach, and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ in all the fullness of his glory and power and to radiate his love to our community and to all the world. Amen. Amen. All right. David's coming up to take up the offering at Mr. Sammy's place. Hallelujah. We love you, David. God. He's just grown up on us. I still remember the little David that come and grabbed you, you know, and hugged, just gave you the best little of hugs when he was little. Now we have to jump up to hug his neck. <laughs> That's all right, darling. All right, Father, we, we thank you for your goodness and mercy. We thank you that you give seed to the sower, that you give us abundance, that you bless us. You meet our every need. You give us seed to sow. You make us a blessing in the earth. It's all what you do in us and through us. We give you glory. We count it an honor and a privilege to sow into the ministry of Open Door Fellowship and into the work of the Lord in Lancaster. Thank you, Father. Thank you for that opportunity. We give you praise as we sow, and we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Love on somebody as you bring your tithes.
a wonderful, there we go. We had to bring it down, down, please, down. Get me down. This is much louder in here with down. There you go. All right, that's good. Thank you. All right, we had a wonderful afternoon ministering to Tammy's family. What that was about was blessing Tammy and blessing her family. And a lot of open door people were here to serve and to give and love, and we sowed. And uh, what we, we attempt to do, we want to learn to, to sow without sorrow, to give without grudges, to bless without bitterness. We learn to be very diligent without distraction. And I feel like we did that today. We want to serve without strife. And I didn't hear any cross words or anybody fussing or arguing. And I told Tammy, I said, the most important thing that I'm concerned about is that we'd be a blessing to you and your family. And as a church family, I believe we did that. And we shared the gospel. We preached the gospel. We sang the gospel. And uh, some of them were surprised. You know, I don't use the handbook that they all use for the funeral. I don't do that. I've never even looked at it. I've got one in my office. I've never even opened it. I just say, Lord, how do you want to do this? Lord, what do you want to do? Tell me what to say. And that's the way I operate. That's the only way I know how to do anything. If he don't tell me, I'm pretty much lost. Well, thank God he always tells me. But I'm pretty much lost if he don't talk. When I prepared that that I did today, I said, Lord, what do you want to say to Tammy's family? That's what he said. He told me to tell them to remember the past goodness. He told me to tell them to rest in present grace. And then that there would always be a revelation of the preeminent glory of Jesus in every situation you can find him. He's not hard to find. He's everywhere. He loves hurting broken people. And that the resurrection was promised by God. And then finally, we can rejoice and praise God in the gospel. And that just came to me. That was just supernaturally. I was sitting back there a Sunday night, and that just came. So that's how we operate here. We, we want to be led by the Spirit. I mean, I've got, I've got a whole bunch of books in my office. I've got these little sermon books called um, Special Sermons for Busy Pastors. And I used to look at those, and I'd get a thought or an idea, and then I'd work up. But, you know, I, I haven't looked at those in 20 years. I'm not that busy. <laughs> if I'm too busy to get in the Word, I'm way too busy. So that's how we operate. And that's the same way we operate in all the services. So let, let me just take a moment and thank you, all of you, for your loving, your giving, your serving, your blessing, your honor. And uh, Tammy's dad, although he never attended church here, I think today was his first time. Am I correct in that? Today was his first time <laughs> to come in church here. But uh, he was a blessing. He was loved. I visited him in the hospital several times. He was a blessing. And uh, most of all, Tammy loved him, and she led him to the Lord and got a confirmation. And did you notice so many people said, I don't know if he made it. Did you hear that? I heard it at least five times. I don't know if he made it. I hope he made it. He didn't go to church. And, you know, when people start talking like that, you can tell where they've been to church. It wasn't here. <laughs> it wasn't here. We know better than that. You know, you don't get in by uh, going to church. You get in by Jesus. One of the most miraculous conversions I ever had in all my life, I went. I was called to go see a lady. Her name was Mom Mary. And I won't say where it was in case someone would ever see the video. But Mom Mary was 83, and she was emaciated and ate up with cancer. And she had been a severe alcoholic. I mean, she had, she had drank, by her own testimony to me, she had drank shots of rubbing alcohol. She drank NyQuil. Well, you know, she just kept trying to get alcohol in her system even until right up to the end. And I went down there several times, and I went in the back bedroom, and it was kind of cold back there, and it was a little bitty shanty of a trailer out in the middle of nowhere, and it just was very unsanitary, and, and her daughter was trying to take care of her, but her daughter had issues, and then I think the, uh, the granddaughter lived there, and the great-granddaughter lived there, and they were all, there were a lot of animals in there, and you know, it was just a lot going on, <clears throat> and I went back there, and I talked to her several times, and about the fifth time I went back, I sat down, and I said, now, Mom, Mary, let me talk to you, and she said, now, I want to talk to you. And she said, promise me you'll do my funeral. And I said, well, I'll, I'll do that for you if you promise me you'll give your heart to Jesus before you go home because I don't want to stand over your casket not knowing that puts preacher in a hard place. That puts preacher in a hard place. And she said, oh, okay, I'll do that. And well, Mom Mary, a couple of weeks after that, I had to travel and then I came back and I got word she was in a coma in the hospital going to die. So I walked in the ICU there and it was just me and her we had that moment and the machines you could hear and it was dark and there was only the one light in the corner and I looked at her and I said now Mom Mary you come back here in Jesus name and I snapped my fingers when I snapped my fingers she rolled over and looked at me she came out of that coma and I said now it's now or never you promised me I looked right in her face I said you promised me you give your heart to Jesus and big tear rolling down her face I said all I want you to do is say Jesus and with all the strength, that little woman with a cancer-filled body, emaciated, ready to die, take her last breath, 
She looked at me and she said, Jesus. The glory of God filled that room. The presence of Jesus filled that room. Her face lit up like an angel. She turned her face to the wall, took her last breath, and went home. That's all you need. Just say his name. I read in my Bible, Romans 10, 13, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, that's not God's best. It would have been a whole lot better for her to serve the Lord all her life. But, you know, Mom Mary never did that. She was a sweet lady, a very kind lady, but she just decided to give her life to the bottle. The bottle consumed her. She got in it and couldn't get out of it. But at the end of her days, Jesus was right there with open arms. And all she had to do was say, Jesus. And he just took her in his arms. And he that cometh to me, well, I know why I was cast out. So... I was a little bit surprised to hear several people say that today because you can know that you know. You don't have to guess or hope. We're not leaving this to chance. We go by what God said. And God's word cannot lie, cannot fail. We are saved because we have believed in our heart. God raised him from the dead. We have confessed with our mouth the Lord Jesus. You shall be saved. Well, I'm saved according to Romans 10, 9 and 10. Romans 10, 13. I'm saved and so are you. So we're thankful we have the opportunity to minister to our family today. And the thing I loved about it, when I called her out and we her and I were talking in the hall, Tammy and I were talking, and I said, now, look at me. I said, are you pleased? And she said, Pastor, I want to shout. I'm so happy. And I said, now, think about it. Think about it. This is the day that we're celebrating your dad's home going, so your father's passed away, and here you are in church. And because of the gospel, you're standing here with a big old smile on your face. You're full of joy, and you're walking out, and you're going back to your house knowing, although he ain't there, he's with the Lord. I said, that's what the gospel will do. It'll work when there's a casket up here. It'll work when there ain't a casket up here. It'll work when the doctor says yes. It'll work when the doctor says no. It'll work. We just need to believe God. So we're thankful for that. So I do admire your stamina and uh, your tenacity for staying and coming back. <laughs> I got soaking wet preaching that. You know, I got carried away. Uh, you know, I had a man come up to me and he said, I didn't know white guys could preach like that. I said, man... That's what he told me. He said, I didn't know white guys could preach like that. I said, white men can't jump, but some of us can preach. <laughs> May not be able to jump too high, but praise God. I might not be Dr. J on a basketball court, but I can preach a little bit. Hallelujah. <laughs> he did. He pulled me close and said, I didn't think white guys could preach like that. I said, well, praise God. Jesus is good. So we had a good day, and I appreciate it. So we're going to take these moments and get in the Word. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. And so I know... You're tired in body and thought, and I left here soaking wet myself, and so I know what a day I've had, a long day, but a good day, a blessed day, and that turned out wonderful. We had beautiful weather, 86 degrees outside, not a cloud in the sky. We had a wonderful service. We had a great time together. The music was awesome. The fellowship was good. We blessed and fed Tammy's family. She left rejoicing, and that's the way the gospel works. It just changes everything. It'll take gloom and doom and turn it into joy and peace. That's just the way jesus operates i am the resurrection and the life he turns everything around you can't put jesus anywhere where he can't change everything he just changes everything now tonight we're going to start this last part of this thought in our uh, eighth day we're in a new day now you know this you're in a new day with a new covenant new spirit new heart and we are free now we are free and you're a new creature in christ redeemed and blessed healed and free you're blessed you are redeemed by the blood of the lamb you're in a brand new day this is the day the lord's made it's marvelous in our eyes. It's the Lord's doing. It's the day the stone the builders rejected became chief of the corner. I've seen the day. And remember what God said to us Sunday. See, I have. See, I have. Don't see I'm going to. See, I have. This day. I have. Which, if you can hear it prophetically, God said, see, I have this day. This day is reserved for you. This day is given to you. This day belongs to you. See, I have this day. This day is not 24-hour period, but it's the realm of spirit where you can walk in Christ, in the law of the spirit of life in Christ, not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's your day. It's your time. It's now in Christ Jesus. So as we're walking through this, we came to this revelation of the spirit, Romans 8, 26 through 28. So let's read this again, and then we'll go to a totally different thought here tonight. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the spirit helps our infirmities, or the Greek would say he takes hold with us against our weakness, frailty, lack of ability, and those things that plague us. He takes hold with us, not without us, but the Spirit of God's in me to combat all that is my weakness and all that's my frailty and all that's my fallenness. He's in me to combat that with me. He won't do it without me, but he will do it with me. For we know not, and that's our greatest infirmity, we know not. And when you don't know, you're not sure. And when you're not sure, you're uncertain. And when you're uncertain, there's room for doubt. When there's room for doubt, there's room for deception. 
And when there's room for deception, there can be room for all kinds of other things that will come in. But when we know, we become sure, steadfast. You can't talk me out of my salvation. You can't talk me out of my healing. You can't talk me out of the new covenant. You can't talk me out of the blood on the mercy seat. I'm sure you could come to me. Matter of fact, isn't this something? I was talking to somebody yesterday when they were telling me how Psalms 46, if you can believe this, I had somebody tell me this yesterday. Psalms 46 was really a tribute that King James put in the Bible for William Shakespeare and it didn't belong in the Bible. He told me that. And I thought to myself now, <laughs> what dumbbell told you that? And of course, he asked me and he said, I don't believe that. I said, I don't believe that either. I said, I think a man would believe that. You know, he probably got it from a dumbbell and he is a dumbbell. And you know, two dumbbells don't make a right bell. You know, I'd rather hear a cowbell around a cow's neck in a tin barn at midnight than I would to hear, listen to somebody tell me Psalm 46 don't belong in the Bible. You know what Psalms 46 said? Be still and know that I'm God. There is a river that make the streams of the city of our God glad. That's in Psalms 46. The Lord is a very present help in time of trouble. Forgive me, but I ain't finding Shakespeare there. I went back to read it. I looked for him. I couldn't find him. I don't know where he got the idea of Shakespeare. That's some tribute to Shakespeare. But, man, that's just a bunch of nonsense. Man, if you don't got better sense than that, you need to come to my office. Let me preach to you to get faith. Lord have mercy. When we don't know, there's room for deception. The very idea you pick up your Bible and say Psalms 46 don't belong. <laughs> How do you get to that? Well, you have doubt. You don't know. We know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit. He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And I love this. Notice in verse 26, we know not. Now in verse 28, we know. We've moved from not being sure to being sure. We're sure now. We know God is on the throne. We know the blood is on the mercy seat. We know Jesus is risen from the dead. We know that the new covenant is our reality. We know that our sins are put on the tree. Our curse is on the tree. We know some things now. And when you know, you become powerful. My people are destroyed not for lack of prayer, not for lack of giving or tithing. They're not destroyed for lack of uh, fasting. They're destroyed for lack of knowledge. But the next line says, which very few people ever quote, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because they reject it. And God will never hold you accountable for what you don't know and what you haven't heard. But once you hear it, you become accountable for it. We are accountable for what we hear. Take heed lest the light in you become darkness. You know, one of the greatest deceptions men get into is their own light. When you say this is all the light, then that light will become your darkness. Luke eleven thirty five. 35, your light can become your darkness. Your gifting can become your deception. Your anointing can become your downfall. Because the moment you think you've got all the light, you have stopped growing, stopped flowing, stopped knowing, you won't go any further. When you say that about the Holy Spirit, this is all there is. There's nothing beyond this line. You cut yourself off from a world of experience and you begin to have a, a light that becomes a darkness to you. None of us have arrived. We're all going and growing up into him in all things. So we thank God we know some things now. And we know that all things, all that God has done in Christ, all that God is working... And you can't take that into a bigger setting. You know, God's working everything for my good. I understand that. When people curse me, he's working that. As I bless them, he's working on my behalf. If they start cursing me, I say, Father, now I bless them. But in 2 Thessalonians 1, you said that it was a righteous thing for you to trouble them that trouble me. I'm not going to trouble them because I'm looking to you. I bless you. I bless them. I refuse to curse them. I refuse to get on their level. It's like I told you Sunday. There was a man come to me and said, there's some witches down the road here. They got a coven and they're cursing you. I said, no, they're not. I said, I don't care what they do. He said, don't you think they have power? I said, not against me. They don't. No, no. I've already read Numbers 23. You remember? Old Balaam the prophet went up on the hill and when he looked down in the valley he saw this gigantic cross because God always encamped his people in the form of a cross and he offered animals on this side and animals on that side and animals over there and animals over there and he came back and he finally told the king he said look all we're doing is killing animals here we ain't accomplishing nothing because I don't know what that is this is what Balaam the prophet said that is the power of a unicorn and what God has blessed he cannot unbless you can't take it away what God has blessed I can't change it there's a God in the midst of that people and he does not behold their iniquity. And when we stay in the revelation of the cross, man, they can curse us from every angle. They can do all they want to do, but they can't curse you because you're blessed from an almighty God. You're redeemed by the blood and you're blessed and highly favored. Hmm. 
we know that all things work together for good to them who love God and I love God tonight don't you I'm learning to love him more oh that I could love Jesus more and more that's what a prayer oh that I would love Jesus how do you love him you let him love you it's impossible to let Jesus love you and not fall in love with him he's just too good He's just too merciful. He's too kind. He's too giving, too benevolent, too faithful. He's the one that will never say, I'm sorry. He's the one that will never have to say, I'm sorry, I failed you. I turned my back on you. He'll never talk about you. He will never do that. He's faithful to you. He loves you. And so it's easy to love somebody like that. We're growing in our love. We love him. And those who are called, which means invited with an intent. We are invited with intention according to this purpose. Now, we've drawn four thoughts out of this revelation of the Spirit. Thought number one was the indwelling of the Spirit. God lives in you. Amen. Come on, let's shout. God lives in us. God lives in me. He lives in you. Now, that's awesome. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Amen. You're an overcomer because the greater one lives in you. Christ in you is your hope of glory. You look to him. The one in you is more. The, the one in you is greater. The one in you cannot be stopped, cannot be denied. He is absolutely in. He is absolutely unstoppable. He lives in you. And I'm living out of him and he's living out of me. That's the union. He that's joined is one spirit. So there's the indwelling spirit. Number two, we looked at the infirmity of the saints. And the infirmity of the saints here in this case is we don't know how to pray. And we know not what we should pray for. And Jesus bore all of our infirmities on the cross. And Jesus was forsaken at the ninth hour which is the hour of prayer in Acts 3, so we would never be forsaken in prayer. And we know if he hears us, we have. And you ought to have some bold confidence that God hears you pray. When you say in Jesus' name, Father, you got all of heaven's attention, he hears you pray. And we know we have the petitions we desired of him. God hears us, so we have this infirmity dealt with. Now we have utter confidence. We come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Then thirdly, we looked at intercession... And, and the spiritual transition that God takes us on. And there I showed you that we understand the pathway of tradition and transition. We understand it, how God takes us this journey. And then we learn that there's an unction to pray in tongues. And here he's talking about groanings which cannot be uttered. He's talking about praying in the Holy Ghost. And I pray by faith in the Holy Ghost. I pray in tongues every day. I hope that you do. Building yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. There's an unction to pray in tongues. And then there comes an unshakable trust. You become unshakable because you've moved to knowing. And then there's an unspeakable joy. It's just unspeakable. You come to the place where you know. And when you know, then you just cannot be denied. You know. You know. It just becomes your reality. Abraham knew whenever God did that in him and breathed in him in Genesis 17, from that point on, he knew he was the father of a multitude. He knew it. He knew it in his heart. His soul was fixed, established, trusting in the Lord. Nobody can talk you out of it. You become full of joy. It becomes an amazing place. And although there's no physical evidence of it, you know that you know that you know it's yours because they have received it. What's everything you desire when you pray? Believe you receive it and you shall have it so thank God for intercession and spiritual transition and then tonight I want to talk to you about this inheritance and supernatural favor and abundant blessing that's ours we're called according to his purpose now when you look at that the word purpose doesn't look like a lot but it is a revelation of the bread or we could say it is the table of showbread and here from the concordance just a setting forth a place in the view of the showbread, the 12 loaves of wheat and bread corresponding to the number of the tribes of Israel, which loaves were offered to God every Sabbath and separated in two rows, and they lay for seven days and became a front part or portion of the tabernacle and afterwards the temple. So he's telling you here that you have now been called to this table, the table of showbread. And there's great blessings. See, everything God's working is off that table, so we need to go back and get some understanding of the table of showbread, okay? So let's go to Exodus chapter 25. Let's turn there. And that's what we're going to work on tonight. Now, if you've ever sat under uh, teaching in Moses' tabernacle, you probably have some idea what this is. But it's very important. Moses' tabernacle is the grandfather of all revelation knowledge. If there's anything in your Bible that is a revelation, you can go back and find it in Moses' tabernacle. Did you know that? It took nine months to build the tabernacle in the wilderness. It took nine months to build the true tabernacle in Mary's womb. There were 60 boards in the outer court of Moses' tabernacle. There are 60 men in Jesus' genealogy. 
God don't do accidents. Mm. In the outer court and all around the outer fence, the hands of what they call tenions, the way they set those boards up, they had spikes that looked like hands. They were brass and they set them in the ground. There was a judgment, a brass set in the earth and they put each one of those boards representing those 60 men in a judgment and then they covered them with linen cloth and they looked to the brazen altar. Those boards stood at attention looking to the judgment that would come. I mean, God prophesies through that tabernacle all the way through. It's just prophecy after prophecy after prophecy of the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. The colors of gold and purple. The colors of gold and purple. The colors of green, life, gold, divine nature. Purple, the majesty of the king. Red, the crimson flow of his blood. The last time you see brass is in the outer court. Once you go into the inner place, they changed. And those boards of the inner court were set in silver sockets. The men of the inner court, those six times eight, 48 boards, 48 is six times eight, a new man. They stand in silver sockets because now we stand in redemption. I'm not looking to a judgment that's coming. I'm looking from a judgment that's already taken place. We're blessed. The blood is on the mercy seat. Praise God. It just goes endlessly on. So God instructed Moses in Exodus 25. Here's the instruction. He said, first of all, and you know, when God gives order, God is a God of order. You know that. And God never, ever, ever dispels with order. So first thing he says, tell the people to bring an offering. That's instruction number one. Now, what do you need to bring to God tonight? An offering. Now, most people who think carnally think money. You need to bring an offering. What offering do you bring? The offering of Jesus on the cross crucified. That's the offering you bring. There's so many people that will teach you don't appear before God empty. You've got to bring some money. Now, money's important. We all know that. But money is far secondary to the offering of the blood of Jesus and the offering of the Lamb. He tells him in Exodus chapter 25, first, purpose. Number one is purpose. The Lord our God is one God. He tells him, bring an offering. So tonight, I bring an offering. I come before God without one plea, but that the blood was shed for me. I come before God saying, according to your blood, it's the blood on the mercy seat. I come in and through and by and of that blood. Christ is my offering. The Lord kept saying in the book of Malachi, where's my offering? Not yours, where's mine? Where's my offering? His offering's not mine. He put the lamb on the cross. He put Jesus there. I bring the lamb before the Father and the Lord is well pleased with my offering. I don't bring him a lame, halt. I don't bring him a spotted sacrifice. I bring him the pure, sinless Christ who was made sin with my sin. And the first thing God wants us to do as he begins to build a tabernacle is to begin to worship out of the offering of Christ. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive blessing, glory, honor, power. And in Revelation chapter 5, he also tells you, Thou art worthy, for by thy blood thou hast redeemed us. Come on, take a moment with me and just worship according to the blood. Bring an offering before the Lord. Bring an offering. Lord, I offer the sacrifice of your son. I offer the blood of your son, Jesus. I bring nothing but the blood. I look to nothing but that blood. I bring the lamb tonight. Worthy is the lamb. And I set your offering before you. And God says, now you do that. And when you start your worship, you come by blood. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter by the blood of Jesus. You come by blood. First thing God wants you to do is offer an offering to the Lord. And that is his offering, not your money. If you put money ahead, you're going to fail and falter every time. Money is good. It's good to give. It's good to sow. I give up the tithe and offering. But money's secondary. When it comes to worship, God wants you to flow in the offering of Jesus. I offer Jesus before the Father. Doesn't matter how much money that you bring to God, your money will perish with you. Remember Simon the sorcerer, Acts chapter 8? He tried to buy the gift of God. Peter said, your money perish with you. You cannot buy the gift of God. It's freely given. So the first thing he says is, I want you to bring an offering. Second thing he says, I want you to make the Ark of the Covenant. Now that's a picture of Jesus. And he said, you're going to make the Ark of the Covenant. And you make the wooden chest and you overlay it with gold and you put the cherubim there and you put a mercy seat. Because God will never come without a mercy seat. There's some amazing things here we could go back and teach for years. You know, in Exodus 18, God started telling Moses through Jethro, he said, I want to build a tabernacle in a people. He said, you get you some leaders, get them over thousand, hundreds, fifties, and tens. You remember that teaching? The thousand is the most holy place, ten by ten by ten multiplied. And then the hundred was the length of the tabernacle. Fifty was the width of the tabernacle. And ten cubits high was the height of the inner boards of the sanctuary. These outer cubit boards were only five. They had to be measured by grace, but this end is measured by the obedience of Christ. Ten, it's a witness of grace. 
And so what he was teaching there is that, now Moses, I'm going to build this in a people so I can build it through a people. I'm going to build a tabernacle in you, and you know, we could do it this way. The thousand, fold dimension, find some people that know how to rest, that don't get bothered by what is or isn't going on. They rest. The hundredfold dimension is revelation. They know some things that other people don't know. See, we've gone to knowing now. The 50 is relationship or reconciliation. How wide is this church? Who will we accept? Who will we receive? And then the 10 fold or the 10 cubit represents our responsibility. We've grown up into him and now we understand we stand responsible before the Lord to bring this message of the kingdom and the message of the gospel to the world. So the second thing he says to do, now you build the Ark of the Covenant and it was a beaten work of gold and God did that. And then once you have one, which is purpose, and two, which is witness, you see God's purpose through that offering was to bring a witness of Jesus. Where's Jesus tonight? If two or three are gathered in my name, there am I, the Ark of the Covenant's here tonight. The blood-soaked mercy seat is here tonight. Praise God. And God establishes the mercy seat so anybody can come. And the third thing he said, he said, now make me a table. And three is a number of manifestation. Four is a number of universal application five is the number of grace six is man seven is complete eight is new beginning nine is birthing fruit and gifts ten is obedience eleven is disobedience twelve is the number of apostolic government and authority all those things are relevant there's nothing in your bible that's not relevant it's all relevant now exodus 25 23 third instruction you shall make a table of shittim wood two cubits shall be the length thereof and a cubit the breadth thereof and a cubit and a half the height thereof and you will overlay it with pure gold and make thereunto a crown of gold round about. And you will make it unto a border of a hand breadth round about. And you will make a golden crown to the border thereof round about. And thou shalt make four rings of gold and put the rings in the four corners that are on the four feet thereof. Very important. Over against the border shall the rings for the places of the stays be for the table, to bear the table. And thou shalt make the staves of shit and wood and overlay them with gold that the table may be borne with him. And you will make the dishes and the spoons and the covers and the bowls thereof to cover with all of pure gold will you make them so here God's saying when you come to this table the dishes the spoons the knives the forks everything you're feeding from is out of my divine nature it's all gold pure gold pure gold remember he brought them out with silver and gold pure gold and then listen to this verse 30 you will set upon the table of showbread before me always continually always this table of showbread is to be set there before me all right, so let's get this. First of all, whose idea was the table? God gave us instruction to build the table. Now, here's some things that we need to understand about the table. All right, two cubits long. It's about this long, just a little over two feet, two cubits long. So it's not very long. Two's the number of witnesses. So this is God's witness among his people. Then it's only one cubit wide, one is purpose, the witness of his purpose among his people. And then it was only one and one-half cubits high, so if we were to put it on, on the ground here, it would be about that tall. So God never puts the bread at 11 feet four, so you've got to be a giant to get it. He puts the bread where the smallest of children, like Reese, could walk up to this table and eat the bread. And the bigger you are, the further you've got to bow. God put the bread of heaven, the bread that would change the world. He put the bread of revelation, the bread of redemption, the bread of righteousness, the bread of rest, the bread of rejoicing. He put it all in a place where anybody can get to it. You just got to humble yourself. One and one half cubits high. We draw a line through Moses' tabernacle. In the outer court, there was a grate in the brazen altar, which is the cross. One and one half cubits high. You go to the inner court, there was a table. One and one half cubits high. You go to the most holy place, the mercy seat. The lid of it was one and a half cubits high. Redemption, revelation, and rest. Redemption brings a revelation of rest. It's one and one half cubits high. It's not so very far away. And what did Simeon the prophet prophesy over Jesus when he had the baby in his hand? What did he say? He said, anything above this, got to come down. Anything below it, got to come up. This child shall be a line in Israel. That line he was talking about was that one and one half cubit line that ran through Moses' tabernacle. He said, everything above Jesus got to come down. Everything that ain't up to him got to come up. Praise God. See, Jesus is the measuring line for everything in the kingdom of God. It's all Jesus. 
Now notice this. He said it'll have four feet. This table sits in the earth. This bread is so high and so holy and so magnificent, yet God set the table in the earth. It's got four feet because it goes to all four directions. It goes to north, south, east, and west. It's got four feet because this is to be walked out in the earth. This table, what's on this table was to be walked out in a people in the earth. The feet of the table touched the earth. Powerful. Then on, around about the table, there was on the border of it, the outside border, there was a crown. And thank God Jesus is crowned king. There's a crown. But then between the, the second crown was a hand, which represents the ministry. And it's the five-fold ministry, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. It's their responsibility to keep their hand on the table so that between the crown of Jesus being king and Lord, he's king of kings and Lord of lords, between those two crowns that Jesus wear, there must be a preaching of the king and the Lord. And the hand is there to steady and to guide and make sure that the bread doesn't come off of the table. And then the bread was set in order. There was six in each row. And six is the number of man. And this is where man comes back to God's order. This is where man comes back to God's order is by feeding on the bread. I wish I had time to preach and I wish you were alive enough to receive it tonight. Listen to this. If a son asks bread, won't give him a stone. Let's look at this for a moment. You know the bread and the stone were both broken? And did you know when the stones were broken, men died? When Moses threw those stones down, men died. 3,000 men died. But do you know, I'm going to shout, do you know when the bread was broken that every man on planet earth can live because the bread was broken? Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Every man on planet earth can live because the bread was broken. When the law was broken, men died, but the bread was broken. Men live. Hallelujah. And that poor little woman comes and said, my daughter has a devil. And Jesus said, it's not me to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. And she smiles and says, yea, Lord. But even the dogs eat the crumbs from under your table. And Jesus turned to her and said, healing is the children's bread. And she said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat from underneath your table. And he looked at her and smiled and said, woman, great is your faith go that way for that saying the daughter has received her healing and the devil has gone out of her and she went home and found her daughter healed here's the thought if one crumb from under the table could get that Gentile woman's daughter healed of a devil you got a right to come to this table and feed on all 12 loaves they all belong to you you don't get one of the loaves. I mean, you get everything that Jesus is in those 12 loaves. I am the bread come down from heaven. When the law was broken, men die. When the bread was broken, men live. And we are living. This bread was broken for us. What a revelation and what power there is in the bread. It's the table of showbread, and it goes before God always. This bread is always before God. So God wants you to sit down at the table and eat on bread. You know why? Because all God's children love living bread. And Jesus said, I'm the bread come down from heaven. Your fathers did eat the man in the wilderness and they're dead. But if you'll eat this, if you'll eat of me and you'll take of my flesh and drink of my blood, then you'll never die and you'll have part with me. This bread is powerful. If it got the devil out of her daughter with a crumb, you don't have a right to the crumbs, darling. You got a right to the whole loaf. You got a right to come to the table. He prepares a table before me. This is your table in the presence of your enemies at all, every bit of it. All the bread on this table belongs to you because God freely gave it. It belongs to you. It belongs to you. So God gave the instruction and it had to be done exactly the way God said. This table couldn't be four feet high couldn't be nine feet high God made it accessible God made it in a place where anyone could come bow and receive of it and God wants you to learn to feast at this table you see you're called Romans 8 28 according to this table so it would just do us well to realize there's something here at the table that God wants us to feed on and to walk out of so there's some instruction on how to build the table now let's get some insight of truth now look at Leviticus he brings this up again in Leviticus 24 man that's good about the law and the bread isn't it the stone is broken men die when the bread was broken men live now here's some amazing things about Jesus you know Leviticus 
I often tell people, if you want to get bored, you read the book of Leviticus without the Holy Ghost, and it'll, bore you, it'll put you to sleep. I mean, if you really want to get bored, it will bore you to tears. But when you get in the Spirit, you start seeing Jesus everywhere. 24-5 of Leviticus. 24-5. You will take fine flour, bake 12 cakes thereof, and two tent deals shall be in one cake. You will set them in two rows, six on a row, upon the pure. Notice God calls this the pure table. This is not a defiled place. This is the pure table before the Lord. And you will put pure frankincense upon each row that it may be the bread for a memorial. See, God, this is a memorial before God. This bread is a memorial before God, what Christ did. Even an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. He calls the bread the everlasting covenant. And it shall be Aaron and his sons or the old covenant priesthood. They shall eat in the holy place for it is most holy unto him of the offerings of the Lord made by fire by a perpetual statute, meaning that it cannot be altered or changed. So what this represents is taken into the new covenant and it will never change. You got a right to this bread. So God's instruction for building the table number two tonight, uh, insights for the blessings and truth that are here. Now notice that this bread is made of fine flour. That means that it is absolutely fine. That's the character of Jesus. That this flour has nothing in it except purity. If we examine Jesus, if we look at his character, we look at his conviction, his conversation, his conduct, his conscience, and his confidence, we'll find Jesus to be fine flour. This bread is not made out of you and me. It's not made out of a bunch of stuff that won't work. It's made out of fine flour. I just want to shout tonight, Jesus is fine flour. <laughs> Praise God. And he said, you'll take it and you will take two tenth deals. Two out of ten. What's that? That's a picture of the two commandments that Jesus said all the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. And Jesus is the only one that kept the two. The two commandments were, you will love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul. You will love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus came, and in the Garden of Gethsemane, he loved God with all his heart, mind, and soul, and laid everything he was down to please the Father. And then he loved his neighbor. He took us up and died. And no greater love hath any man for his friend than that he give his life for him. And that's what Jesus did. The two tenths of fine flour, the two tenth deals, he fulfilled it there. It's powerful. Then notice this. He says, you'll take and you will put these in one cake bacon. So Jesus had to be bacon in the fires of judgment. You know, Jesus took all of our fire of judgment. In Psalms 22, my heart is melted within me like wax. In Acts chapter 2, his soul was not left in hell. Jesus took all the fire there was to take. All of it fell on Jesus. So Jesus was baking in the oven of my judgment. Thank God that's over. Thank God he died my death and took my judgment and took my curse. Thank God that he did that. Bore all of my judgment. But then you'll notice this is to be baking into one cake. And you and I, according to 1 Corinthians 10, we being many are one bread. We're now bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. And now this has been mingled into us and us into this bread. We become bread. We are bread one for another. We're bread for the world. We're bread for the world. And it's one bread, one cake before the Lord. Then he said, you're to set it in rows of six, which again is God restoring man to order. Six is the number of man. So God sets us here and these six loaves come in agreement in line and God's provided everything you need in every way you need through this bread. Joshua and Caleb and, uh, in the book of Joshua 14, in the book of Numbers chapter 13 and 14, he just simply said, our enemies are bread for us. When you feed on this bread, your enemies are there because Jesus took your enemies on the cross. When you feed on this bread, your victory over your enemies are in this bread. Mm. Praise God. And he said, you'll take pure frankincense, which is pure white substance, speaks of his righteousness. And he said, you'll pour it upon each row so that our life is just saturated with the concept that Jesus is righteous. Jesus is pure Jesus is holy Jesus is righteous and cannot fail then he calls this an everlasting covenant God here made an everlasting covenant with you in Hebrews 13 20 he calls this the blood of the everlasting covenant 
This can never be broken. Jesus, the bread, has already been broken. The covenant cannot be broken. The only thing you can do is believe or not believe. The covenant can't be broken. It's an everlasting covenant. And then he says, you're to eat it perpetually for a statute. It is an offering of the Lord made by fire. It's given freely. It's an offering of the Lord. It is a statute forever. It belongs to us. The bread is ours tonight. All of the bread is ours tonight. Every bit of it. Everything that this bread is. Are you ready to shout tonight? Jesus is this bread. So everything he is from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet to the end of his fingers, all of it was freely given. All of it was freely broken and freely torn apart and God took him and began to divide him a portion with the strong and the spoils with the strong. And you and I become strong by feeding. We become strong by feeding on this bread. You know, when you go back to Mephibosheth's story, he ate bread at the king's table all the days of his life. But you know what? That bread of David could never heal his feet. He never was able to walk. He had to sit across every day from Solomon and from Absalom. And he sat there and sat there and sat there. And he fed with them boys. And they were the two best looking boys in the land. They were the richest and the best. And they had the best. And he sat there, but he remained a cripple. But you and I, come on. You and I, we come to our king's table. And you start feeding on this bread. Your feet can't stay crippled if you feed on this bread. You're going to start walking in some stuff. Oh, I'm, I'm just so drawn here. A lot of people are like the man in Acts chapter 3. They're laid at a gate called beautiful. Man, you're in a beautiful place tonight. You're in Christ. The gate is open. The, the, the doors are open. Everything God wants to do is open to you. You can walk in the Spirit. You can walk in power. You can walk in faith. You can walk in the anointing. You can walk in glory. It's all open to you tonight. Every bit of it. But yet he sat lame from his mother's womb. Could not walk in anything he saw. Saw other people walking in it, but he couldn't walk in it. Mephibosheth could never walk in anything because of David's bread. But you and I aren't feeding on David's bread. We're feeding on Jesus, and Jesus can heal our feet to where we can walk in some things. Praise God. So there's amazing insights here and truth of things we learn. It's called the bread of rest. It's the bread of revelation. It's the bread of, bread of riches. If we take the table of showbread from Moses' tabernacle and we follow it into Solomon's temple, you know what happened to it? It multiplied 10 times. And when you got to Solomon's tabernacle, you didn't have one table. You had 10 tables. You didn't have 12 loaves. You had 120. And you had 120 people on the day of Pentecost. Whew. It just keeps multiplying. This bread just can't fail. It's too much. It's just, it's incredible. So God says, now I've called you. Everything's working. I've called you to the table. Now, we'll work on this, and this will be as far as we can go tonight. Just a few more moments, and we'll, we'll, we'll close tonight. Infused relative. Just depends on how much preach I feel sneak up on me, okay? <laughs> I might not be helping you. I'm helping me tonight. Praise God. Reminding me of how gracious this table is. It's a made available. Reese could walk right up to this table and get it. She don't have to be 24 years old and have a college degree to get this bread. We can feed it to her now. She's two and a half years old. We can tell her about Jesus now. Jesus heals you, Reese. Jesus blesses you, Reese. Jesus is your anointing, Reese. Jesus is your deliverance, Reese. She can get it now. She can feed on bread now. She don't have to go to grow up to get it. She can get it right now. It's made available to the child. This bread belongs to Heidi as small as she is. And while she can't comprehend it yet, we can still put it in her. Pray it over her. It's the bread. Now, let's look at the tribes. And this is an old teaching we did long ago, and hopefully you still remember some of it. But you know there are 12 sons of Israel. And these 12 sons picture and portray the Lord Jesus Christ and the new covenant people who are the seed of Abraham. If we go back to the old covenant and we study the old covenant, we'll find out each tribe had an identity. They had an infirmity. They had an intercessor on the breastplate of the high priest. One of their stones was there. And then they had an inheritance in Deuteronomy 33. Moses blessed them and spoke over them before they went into the promised land. Now, in the new covenant, thank God, we have an identity. Jesus bore our infirmity. Jesus bore our infirmity. For example, Reuben was unstable as water. That was his infirmity, instability. Well, in the new covenant, Jesus on the cross went up and down. The way they crucified him, he would go down. 
And then he would push up. And when he push up, his, his calves and his hamstring and his back, the vertebrae in his back, and the disc would begin to rupture after a period of time. And so he couldn't stay up and he'd sink down. And when he sank down, he'd drown in his own fluids. That's the struggle of life. When you feel like you're under it and you're drowning. And then you try to push up, but you can't maintain it because things start rupturing. You just can't do it. Down and up. Jesus bore your infirmity so you don't have to be as unstable as water. He'll put strength in you and make you as stable as he is. He'll fix your heart and make you steadfast, strong in the Lord. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Hallelujah. Always abounding. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Simeon and Reuben was cruel as a, Simeon and Levi was cruel as a sword. You know, and Jesus bore our cruelty. He was punished. He was beaten. His beard was plucked. He bore our cruelty. Judah was seduced with deception. Zebulun was prejudiced. Issachar bowed between two burdens and became a servant, a tribute, and never reigned. Dan was a serpent, serpent-like. Gad was overcome. Asher became fat and lazy. Fed on the king's dainties until he was worthless and could do nothing. He gorged himself to the point where he was of no value to anyone. Naphtali was a hind let loose. He was loose but had no authority or government. Joseph would be persecuted all the days of his life and Benjamin would become a wolf and all that's relevant but I got good news for you tonight it's not relevant to us because Jesus bore all that on the cross and himself took our infirmity so I'm not cruel tonight I'm not unstable as water I'm not being seduced I'm not prejudiced praise God I'm free from all that I'm not serpent with a forked tongue I'm not being seduced I'm not lazy but diligent I'm not being taken I'm not a hind let loose with no authority I'm under government and authority I'm free praise God he bore our infirmity so let's take it over and let's put it in the new covenant. Now the first thing you see in this bread and, and always is the rule. You need to see Jesus. You need to see Jesus. You ready? Reuben means behold the son. So Jesus comes and said, I'm the son of God. Behold Jesus. When you take the first loaf out, you get a revelation. He's the son of God. How precious it is. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son the first loaf you take you get a revelation of the bread of heaven Jesus the son of God Amen. second loaf you take and break it to hear God Simeon means to hear God Jesus heard God and Jesus said I only do what I see my father do and I only say what I hear my father say he's our Simeon Levi, third loaf, means join to the Lord. And Jesus came and said boldly, and this is what got him in trouble. He said, I and my Father are one. He would never agree with their thought of separation. He would never agree that he was separate from the Father. And they kept saying to him, boy, I love this. They kept saying to him, you are a man and you made yourself God. And he'd smile and said, no, boys, you got it backwards. I'm God and I made myself a man. Yeah. Hallelujah. They kept saying, you're a man, you make yourself God. Jesus said, oh, no, 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 I'm Emmanuel. I, I, God, the Father, and I are one. My Father's greater than all. He was our Levi. He was joined to the Lord. He said, I come from my Father. I go to my Father. I do what I hear my Father say. I, I see and I do what my Father does. I'm one with my... And they said, Philip, 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 have I been with you this long and you've not seen the Father? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And if you don't believe me for what I say, believe me for the work's sake. Because the Father that tabernacles in me, he doeth the work. And it made people furious in that day because there was no separation consciousness in Jesus. He would not agree with their separation consciousness. Fourth loaf you take out is Judah. And I'd heard all my Christian life, Judah means praise God. And you know what? Judah's deeper than that. Judah doesn't mean just praise God. Judah means he shall be praised. And when you look at Jesus, you get one glimpse that the Father should be praised and shall be praised. Judah doesn't mean praise God. Judah means he shall be praised. You've got to be specific. This means he shall be praised. And Jesus became the praise of God in the earth. Let me go a little further. He's the praise of God in the heavens. He's the praise of God under the earth. And he's the praise of God in my heart. His name is Jesus. He's the praise of an almighty God. Zebulun, you take the fifth. Isn't it amazing? 
One is purpose. The purpose was in a son. Two is witness. He heard God. Three is manifestation. I and my father are one. Four is universal. He becomes a universal praise of God. No matter where you go, put him in China, put him in Russia. I've done it. I've, I've stood with believers in Russia. Gilinchek, Anapa, Moscow. I've stood there in places in the Bahamas. I've stood places in Germany. I've stood. And no matter where you put this bread, always goes back to God. He becomes universal praise. He's above the language barrier. He's above the linguistics barrier. He's above the culture barrier. His name is Jesus. They call him Jesus. They call him Jesus Egospos. They call him Jesus. They call him Yahshua. It don't matter. He's still Jesus. Jesus to me, but to some Yahshua, to some Jesus, some Jesus, doesn't matter. He's universal. That brings praise out of every believer. How about this? Five is the number of grace. And Zebulun means the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God. Where did God dwell? He dwelled in Jesus. The first dwelling was with the Garden of Eden. God dwelt with man there. After man fell, Moses' tabernacle. After that fell apart, David's tabernacle. They brought the ark into David's tabernacle. They lifted up the flaps of an old tent. David was in the palace and David wanted God to be praised in Israel 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He wanted God to be blessed. So he put the ark of God and he put an old tent up on Zion's hill and he lifted up the flaps and David commanded him that hour by hour, 1,000 singers and musicians would go in and praise God. And as they left after their hour, another thousand would come in. That's why David wrote, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is to be praised. God dwelt there. God came down and God liked that. They praised him day and night, night and day. And when David was king in Israel, there was not one grove. There was not one house of idolatry. God was to be praised. The God of Israel was to be glorified. That tent, that glorious tent that had no courts in it, you could just come before the presence of God for yourself. Praise God. When you go to Acts 15, God prophesied to raise that up again. We're in that tent tonight. You know, you're in David's tabernacle tonight. You know, the flaps are up and you can come worship God for yourself. Praise God. Do you know that all the courts have been removed and you ain't out of court, in the court, most holy place? You're seated with him in the heavenly places. You can worship him. Praise God. You can come and we can come in here singing. We can leave singing. We can come shouting. We can leave shouting. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Garden of Eden. Moses' tabernacle. David's tabernacle. Then Solomon's temple. God told David, he said, no, you can't build me a house, you're a bloody man, but Solomon will build it. Wisdom built the house. And God let him build this magnificent structure, multiplied of everything Moses' tabernacle was. And Solomon got on the brazen altar and lifted up his hands, and the king was sacrificed, and a picture of the king being sacrificed. And at that point, the glory of heaven filled Solomon's temple, and the priest could not stand to minister. That was the fourth dwelling of God. the fifth dwelling of God they rebuilt that after the return and then Herod came in and finished it and Jesus walked into that temple Herod's rebuilt of Solomon's temple Jesus walked into that temple and when Jesus walked in there God Almighty walked in the flesh and Jesus took the book and Jesus opened it up and he said the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the gospel to the poor to preach recovering of sight to the blind, to heal the brokenhearted, set at liberty them that are bruised, and deliverance to the captives, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book as to say, I fulfilled it. And he gave it to the priest, and he sat down, and every eye was fastened on him. And God dwelt in that temple that day. The fifth time God dwelt, Jesus went into that temple, and he dwelt there, but they wouldn't receive him. Remember what happened? They got mad at him. They tried to kill him. They wanted to take him out and kill him. So he walked out, and that's what he did. He shook the dust off his feet and he said, listen to it. I leave your house desolate unto you. Not my house anymore. I was wounded in the house of my friends. One way he was wounded in the house of his friends is because he went into his own house and they wouldn't receive him. Whew. The sixth dwelling was the person of Jesus himself. See, he's Zebulun. He's the sixth dwelling of God. Six God dwelling in a man. What man? Jesus. Jesus could go anywhere at any moment, any time because God was dwelling. God was living in him. And then Jesus was on the cross and then God departed from the sixth temple. And tonight, the seventh temple sits in this house. The seventh temple sits in this house. Don't you know you're the temple of the Most High God? 
He purchased you with his own blood. And now he's moved in you and you're Zebulun tonight. He's dwelling in you. Hallelujah. He will not leave you nor forsake you. He purchased you with his own blood. Hallelujah. Zebulun. Five, that's grace. Six was Issachar. And Jesus became our Issachar because Jesus came in the Garden of Gethsemane, got on his knees, and he knelt between two burdens. He had the burden of a heart that was one with the Father and the burden of a heart that loved broken, crying, dying, sighing humanity. And he bowed between two burdens, and Jesus then became a servant to tribute. Jesus became the slave that we were. And Jesus went under the weight of both burdens. And Issachar means burden bearer. And Jesus bore all of our burdens. He took all of our care. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He had, as it were, our, our faces from him. We esteemed him not. Surely we have esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. When Isaiah first looked at that, he began to assume that God did that to Jesus because of Jesus but when he looked closer he realized I thought he was afflicted and he was wounded because of what he did but I realize now he was wounded for my transgression bruised for my iniquity that's why and then seven Dan completion Dan means judgment and on the cross you see Dan and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness what was Dan like? Dan was like a serpent and as Moses lifted up the serpent on the wilderness even so must the son of and our judgment fell on Jesus. Everything that was against me, all the handwriting of ordinances that was against me, fell on the Lord Jesus Christ. Every bit of it. Dan. And then Jesus becomes our Gad. Gad would be overcoming for three days and three nights. Jesus became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. And when Jesus stepped into that dimension, Jesus became obedient to death. He had to. Why? Because death was your master. Death was your ruler. And Jesus took your place there. In the realm of the fallen, in the region of the damned and doomed, Jesus took your place there. But Gad would overcome. The prophecy on Gad was, you'll be overcome, but you'll overcome. So although he was overcome for three days and three nights in our, in our defeat and what we were, Jesus overcame. And when you put him in hell, he ends up with the keys of death and hell. Come on, can you shout tonight? Jesus rose up, up from the grave. He arose with a mighty triumph for his flows. Foes, he flows tonight. He has the keys of death and hell. Praise God. And Jesus is our Asher. He's the joy of the whole earth at the right hand of God. He's the joy of the Father. He's the joy of the kingdom. He's the joy and the pleasure that delights all of heaven and all those who know him. He becomes our Asher tonight. And then Jesus becomes our Naphtali. He's a hind let loose. As to imply that the hind or the deer was pinned up and the deer was taken in a trap. But God set him free from the trap of the sin of our death. And when he was let loose, what did he do? He giveth goodly words. And this risen Christ is here to talk. And when he talks, supernatural things happen. He is here to give goodly words. He's got a good word for you tonight. He don't have a bad word for you tonight. He gives goodly words. <laughs> you got Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Zebulun, Iscar, Dan, Gad, Asher, Naphtali. Joseph means increase. And tonight at the right hand of God, Jesus will never stop increasing. Of the increase of his government, there will be no end. And he must increase. It's the prophetic word over him. He must increase. There's no way. Oh, praise God. God put that little seed of his word behind the veil of Mary's virginity. And that grew to be a baby. And that baby outgrew the womb. And then God put that man behind the veil of death and that man outgrew the veil of death and he tore it all apart and he came back in this dimension through the veil of death and ripped it apart. He outgrew the womb, he outgrew the tomb and God put him in you. I got a feeling he's bigger than you. I got a feeling he's gonna show up in you. He's gonna come out in us. Woo, praise God. Yeah, you're foolish to think you can contain him. Lord, just come on out. Just manifest your glory. He's increasing tonight. And then finally, Benjamin means son of the right hand. Where is he tonight? He's at the right hand of God. And the son of the right hand is favored tonight. All favors put on Jesus. All blessings put on Jesus. 
All healing and blessing belong to Jesus. All of it. How much of it? All of it. Well, here's some good news. You ready? You're an heir of God. And a joint heir with Christ. So when you come to this table, the first thing you do is realize, now watch this, and I'm going to close. The first six loaves represent Jesus in the earth wall. The first five will bring you to the point where he bows in the Garden of Gethsemane. The sixth loaf is where he drank the cup. The seventh and the eighth is where he took the judgment. The ninth, the tenth, the eleventh, and the twelfth are the resurrection, ascension, seating, and present day ministry of Jesus. This bread represents the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The first five, the Son of God, came hearing God one with God, the universal praise of God, many worshiped in that day, and then he was the tabernacle of God, he tabernacled among us, and then he went in the Garden of Gethsemane, became the man bowing to the burden, from that point he became the judgment, he became the overcomer, he became the overcomer, he becomes the joy of the Lord, raised from the dead, he becomes the high let loose, the increase of God, and finally he's the son of favor, living to save all those who will trust in him, his name is Jesus. It's bread tonight. Table to show bread. Now, Romans 8, 28 says, you're called according to that bread. Praise God. Let's stand together. I think I've wore you out tonight. I'm energized because I'm up here preaching. Praise God. I'm under an anointing, so I'll probably be tired when I quit. <laughs> but you cannot, you cannot preach us first. What a mistake to go back and preach us first. If you miss Jesus in the bread, you missed everything. It's Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus heard God. Jesus joined to the Father. Jesus, one with the Father. All right. Look at this. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, the Spirit which is of God. We've received this Spirit tonight that we might know. What's Romans eight twenty eight, And we know. The things, what things? Everything I just showed you in that table. The two crowns, the hand breath, the twelve, the set in order, the pure frankincense. The table of showbread is the covenant. It's the pure table, the frankincense on it. We might know the things which are freely given to us of God. All that belongs to you. All the table belongs to you. Every bit of it belongs to you. Praise God. And look at this and we'll close. Let no man glory in men. All right, that's easy to do. Huh. I got that one. I'm not going to glory in men. I got that. Praise God. Well, now let's shout. All things are yours. Where did he get that from? 212. All things are freely given. All, are you, are you reading that? Shout tonight. All things are yours. Put it in there. Healing's yours. Deliverance is yours. Freedom's yours. Prosperity's yours. All things are yours. Praise God. Now watch this. Look at the verse. Next verse. Whether Paul, Apollos, or Cephas, the world, life, death, things, present, things to come, all are yours. So he takes you through different dimensions. He said, no matter what men are preaching, you know, you don't have to decide through a favorite preacher. You know, you get it all. That preacher's preaching faith. Faith belongs to you. Get it. That preacher's preaching healing. Get it. Belongs to you. That preacher is preaching prosperity. Get it. Belongs to you. That preacher is preaching deliverance. Get it. Belongs to you. See, he mentions the ministry. Paul, Apollos, or Cephas. That's Peter. Now, those three were carrying the weight of the apostolic word. So that's yours. Or the world. Now, here's some good news. Everything out there belongs to us. This is our planet. You know why? Because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everywhere you go, everywhere you put your foot, it belongs to you. Huh. It belongs to you. I was in the airport one day and waiting on my ride and I just got off a plane I was going to a conference and this guy come out and man he was in a hurry he's on my plane man he was dressed sharp he had an Armani suit on he had some alligator shoes them shoes were so fresh they were snapping at the curb I mean them alligator shoes were snapping at the curb that man he looked like money I mean dude looked like money and he come up there and he goes I need a taxi I need a taxi I need a taxi I need a taxi I need help, help. I'm losing millions of dollars. I'm, yeah, okay. And so I had my, I had a ride pull up, taxi, and I said, all right, come here, come here. 
You go ahead and take mine. I'm not in a hurry. He said, really? Shook my hand, jumped in, and took off. And somebody else asked me, he was on the plane I talked to you. Said, you know him? I said, yeah, he's working for me. Because whatever he's out there doing, heaping up a fortune, it don't matter how much he stores up. It belongs to me because it belongs to him. The wealth of the wicked's laid up for the just, praise God. And the just is Jesus. And whatever's his is mine, praise God. You got to quit thinking the world belongs to the devil and to his crowd, it don't. Come on, help me preach. Or life, things in life, I'll preach their Jesus life. Everything in his life belongs to me. How about this? Everything in his death belongs to me. Everything his death provided, it belongs to me. Hallelujah. Or things present. Man, there's present truth. There's some present things. How about this? Things to come. What's out there? I don't know, but I have not seen, ear have not heard. It hasn't entered into the heart of, of them that love God and what he's prepared for them. But everything out there and world to come, it's all yours. Whatever's beyond the veil, whatever's in eternity, it's all yours. He bought and paid for your eternity. It's all yours. And how many times can he say it? He said, go back, Sandra, go back with me. He said, all are yours. You see that? When any preacher's preaching, it's the scripture in the new covenant. What's in the world, what's in his life, what's in his death, what's present, what's to come, it all belongs to you. Now watch this. Here's where he closes it. And you are Christ. Come on, shout. Oh, redeemed with precious blood. I belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. And who does Jesus belong to? Come on, shout tonight. Ah, you're Christ. And I keep hearing this little voice say, if you're Christ, you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Uh, heirs of God join there with Christ. Um, and Christ is God's. So everything he is belongs to the Father and everything the Father is belongs to him and everything they are belongs to us. You are Christ. Now folks, on a Wednesday night when we're all tired, it ain't gonna get no better than that. Man, we can't shout now. We ain't got no shout in us, man. Praise God. Come on, lift up holy hands. Give the Lord a shout. Come on, give the Lord a shout. All things are yours. <laughs> All things are yours. All things are yours. All things are yours. Hallelujah. Walking in Walmart belongs to you. Praise God. All things are yours. Come on, come on. Start thinking like like a king start thinking like a, a prince and a priest and a prophet start thinking like a son or daughter of the most high God and father right now we receive your revelation tonight. you have called us according to this table you have blessed us you have anointed us you have filled us and healed us and father I'm just rejoicing tonight thank you for the day we've had thank you for this seed sown now Lord let us get this let us take it the bread I'm just reminded to tell you the law was broken men died the bread was broken men live and I hear Jesus say, take, eat this, my body, broken for you. He took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and said, take, eat this, my body, broken for you. Just receive the bread tonight. Just receive the bread. You don't have elements in your hand, but just receive Jesus. Jesus, you're my bread. Jesus, you're my bread. And I feed on you, Jesus. I feast on you, Jesus. I come to this table. I humble myself. And I thank you. You're blessing your people. May we be filled. And you know, what Jesus told that little woman, there's a, a, another word he gave her that I didn't mention tonight. You know what Jesus said in one of the Gospels? The woman that came about her daughter? He said, uh, let the children first be filled. So let's let the children be filled tonight. What happens when you get full of living bread? What happens when you get full of this bread? Oh, everything. Your mind begins to change. Your mouth begins to change. So, Father, we receive supernatural blessing tonight. Supernatural favor grace and abundance, healing and salvation. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. May we be a Judah people. He shall be praised. In Jesus' name we said together, amen, amen, and amen. Well, come on, give the Lord praise. That turned out better than I thought it was going to. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, God bless you. Altars open. Don't forget, we're going to Rex Fails. 6 o'clock Friday night. Going back Saturday if you want to go. Work day is Saturday morning. It's the hardest we've worked in a while. Praise God.